Welcome. Bonjour. Vous écoutez le podcast Dirty Feet sur les ondes de No More Radio. You're listening to the Dirty Feet podcast on the No More Radio Network. Nous sommes vos animateurs et animatrices. We are your hosts, Alison Burns, J.D. Papillon et Stéphanie Morin-Robert. Listen in. Écoutez. We're going to move you. So I'm here with Pepper Fagin to talk about the announcement of the fall season for the Brooklyn Studios for Dance, uh, or BKSD, here in uh, Brooklyn, New York. And we're going to be talking about that, as well as the launch of their Indiegogo campaign, which is a huge funding campaign to be able to create a sustainable future for the company, for the studio. Hi, Pepper. Hello. Let's start with uh, what is to be expected with the upcoming season in terms of classes and presentations and different activities that are taking place at BKSD. The way that we constructed our uh, fall season was initially to respond to the interests of our communities that are involved at Brooklyn Studios for Dance. That is the professional dance community as well as the local community here in Clinton Hill and Fort Greene in Brooklyn. We held this meeting and asked people what they had uh, experienced in our opening launch, which took place in the spring of 2015, uh, what classes they had enjoyed, uh, what they would like to see offered here, and we listened to everyone's considerations and built our fall season from that feedback. So this fall, we're going to be offering dance and somatics, as well as a a, a community events that are both for professionals as well as non-dancers, are for kids and uh, elderly. And all of these classes are designed to fit into programs of well-being, uh, curriculums that an individual can build for themselves through which they'll have access to somatic uh, awareness training as well as dance, fitness, exercise, and we have community events like social dancing that will mix all types of uh, folks that work in and around Brooklyn Studios for Dance. From my experience here for the week, I've had the pleasure of taking a few classes, um, and I did notice that in in more than one of them, there were people um, over 40, and there were people who were just starting to dance, and there was a beautiful mix of, of demographic in the classes, so that is actually happening. It's not just a dream. How do you engage um, people from all walks to, to participate? As we've built our existence here uh, within Cadman Congregational Church, we have worked closely with the members of the congregation who are mostly over the age of 65, Uh, are many of whom are local to Clinton Hill and um, uh, many of whom don't know much about modern dance or dance history in New York. So they've come to know aspects of this organization. In uh, In order to exist at all, we had to renovate our space, which was an old gymnasium. And in the process of that renovation and getting to know the congregation, them getting to know me and in turn the space we were building and then the community that we were building in that space. They, of course, took interest and told their friends and their friends would show up. I would be around. I'm, I'm constantly around. I'm on the street. I'm talking to people. This is one of the liveliest neighborhoods and certainly one of the most diverse neighborhoods in Brooklyn. Ages, ethnicities, histories in New York and outside. So many people walk down the street in front of our building and I'm able to engage them in conversation and I invite everybody to participate I'll find uh, 
a class for anybody. And I certainly encourage people to come and do something that's not normal to them or something that's difficult for them. And and really, I should say, what I encourage is for them to stay, even if they can't participate, to watch, to try to move alongside, uh, and to be able to articulate what does and doesn't work for them. I don't expect that we're going to work for everybody, but we can always be interested in feedback. And it's as much the marketing, which is it's not something that we've pushed so hard. It's as, it's as much the the marketing as it is our openness and remaining open to anybody who wants to come in and explore the space and responding to that interest. This is very much a response project. And then, if, again, location means so much here. I mean, you, you're speaking about the, the people in the neighborhood participating. Um, you're also talking previously about how a lot of the people who are looking for classes like this who are dancing professionals live in Brooklyn anyway, that, that Manhattan is a trek where a lot of other studios are. This is in proximity to where so many dancers are living and so many dance teachers. We're right in the middle of develop, the developing parts of, the most developing parts of Brooklyn. There's Williamsburg and Greenpoint to the north, to the south. There's Bed-Stuy, Crown Heights, Ditmas Park, uh, towards Manhattan, Prospect Heights, Park Slope, downtown Brooklyn, and Bushwick is just to the outside, uh, towards the west. And this is, this is where people can afford to live. Nobody can afford to live in Manhattan, nor can these dance studios afford to survive there. So just like the tide of uh, residential, and urban de- residential urban development, this has been caught. In, in that shift, and here we are in Brooklyn, able to have a column-free dance space, able to uh, not just be a, a peon in this mammoth, but to have more community significance, which this practice deserves and has the potential to benefit. Uh, uh, it doesn't benefit people when it's closed and limited to a very small codified practice that can only exist in a building with a following. This is more about opening up these practices to a community and letting a community of non-dancers ask questions that we don't get asked because we are we have to fight for our community and fight for our survival and uh, make our dance presence known and uh, be advocates for this practice. We don't we rarely get the interest and the queries and the very basic and important questions from a local uh, non-dancing community. And in turn, we have to clarify what we're doing and maybe ask ourselves what we're doing, why we're doing it, why is it valuable. And this is an opportunity to discover the contemporary state of dance and dance as value-making. Something else that I've experienced this week and that I understand will be a part of your fall programming as well is that you're not offering simply technique-based or, uh, you know, physically focused classes like ballet or or yoga, but you're also offering things like authentic movement and contemplative dance practices, which is what I I got the chance to taste this week um, on a rotation so that there's kind of a, a creative incubator happening here as well. Well, the movement in dance certainly has gone from being a dancer in a company uh, toward being a dancer choreographer uh, or being a dance maker or being an improviser. Uh, and that allows people who, don't, who aren't born with a facility that is traditionally uh, a dancing type body that you might see in ballet or or grew up in a, in, a, in a training opportunity. I mean, so, much, so many dancers started training when they were young, so it seems unachievable when you get to a certain point if you have not had training. Or so many dancers that do have training are bored with that because uh, the physical exploration has hit a, an intellectual uh, limit for them. Being a thinking dancer is an entirely different uh, aspect of training. Being a thinking dancer is making decisions while you're moving. It's participating in an exploration that you are, are articulating with your body. 
It's listening and seeing. It's being present with others. It's noticing what that state does to your body. It has nothing to do with performing or being on and off a stage. It has to do with, with the connection between body politics and perception in society with uh, physical health practice that is unbiased movement, movement um, uh, without goals, movement without utility, and something that's very natural that we train out of ourselves as we grow older, something that is much uh, more comparable to a young child and the way that they move freely and without uh, concern for vanity. There is a practice that links the intellectual potential of opening your body up to its its, its interests and its tendencies and making that part of the conversation and the part of the exploration that's separate from uh, developing the mechanism that is your body and the uh, and, and, and our, our incredible anatomy. It's to say that we want to exercise both of these things one after another and that you get to do that here in, in a single visit. We have these back-to-back -back classes that pair somatics and dance and it is our hope that people will draw the relationship between bringing themselves physically, bringing themselves mentally, how to prepare both of those aspects, and how to unite them as a dancer. And then to, to switch gears and talk for a moment about TBD. TBD. Which is uh, inspired by the Montreal Fringe's 13th hour event, but of course with uh, BKSD's own flavor. Yes, certainly inspired by the Montreal Fringe, 13th Hour, which is, is about camaraderie, and it's about uh, a community in a different state of dance that we need to take example from. So just, just to set it up, it is uh, an event that you've had, uh, you've had four runs now on Friday nights, um, and it's kind of a casual showing situation, uh, and it's... TBD, BKSD, BYOB, just to get all the um, letters in there possible. So to be determined, Brooklyn Studios for Dance, bring your own beer. That's right. We wanted to create a different kind of evening. Uh, so much of New York is on a pedestal, whether you want it to be or not. When you have your studio showing, your process showing, it's still a big deal, it's a showing, there's a lot of weight to it. Emerging artists have trouble getting their work out there because they have to do it through emerging artist programs. But that, that, there's, there's, uh, there's something, there's a fallacy in that. Where, where, where can we show our art without it having to be part of a program in that sense? Where can we just be uh, invited to have an idea and to play it out? TBD is the condition of myself. It's my, my inability or our inability to set up significant dance performances and evenings or large-scale productions. It's responding to that person, that performer that uh, sees the world in this responsive way and is ready to respond but doesn't want to wait months to find a residency opportunity to do, to do so. They can come here on Friday night and show us what they've got. And the audience, they might be drinking a little, they might be standing, they'll, they might be sitting. You might be in one side of the room, the next performer might be in, the, uh, in another. The acts are five minutes or less and it encourages people to try something that has just occurred to them or try a variation of something they're working on or just do it in front of some people. One of the artists last night, Emma Grace, um, made a, an introduction to her piece that, that thanked the audience for letting her work out what she needed to in performance, which I think was a very appropriate thing to say based on what you envision this project to be.
there is an opportunity between an audience and a performer to provide each other community and to, in turn, offer each other therapy. We want to express ourselves and we do it very differently, one to the next. We want to be seen for who we are and taken entirely. Sometimes setting yourself up for a big show and a big performance puts people into a mode of watching, puts audience into a mode of watching that is uh, lopsided. It's not a shared experience in which each party is supporting the other. It's a far more judgmental experience. It's a far more loaded event. And I love living a performing life. And this is an evening in which you as a performer can just get up on stage and live your life. After each bit, we have a little banter in between, we play a game together, we engage the audience, we break it up a little, we have a lot of technical difficulties, we can't really do anything about it right now, but it shows people the reality of what show making is at all. We also take as an audience for granted that there are lights and stage management and these things that go into show making. And rather than not offering those or pretending that we're in, or, or, or hiring or forcing uh, a, a degree of, of uh, technical proficiency that we don't have yet, we show the audience that we need to pick up the light and move it over here and plug it into another. And we chat in the meantime. We have a little sip of beer. We meet our neighbor. It's just part of the evening. And it doesn't run more than an hour and ten minutes anyways. And there's a hang afterward. And it takes the pressure of performance and places it in a different place. Right? Or and, and allow, It takes the pressure of performance and uh, allows it to manifest within... Puts I, it in the right place? Yes, it, it puts pressure in the right place. The pressure should be on making the commitment to perform and not on what you're performing. It's wonderful to see somebody nervous about performing at TBD or saying yes and then getting over whatever they need to get over and just choosing to do it. And the relief that you see uh, that they are afforded in making that choice for themselves and having that opportunity to, to make that choice. I'm going to choose to be on stage or not, not wait to be chosen by some existing uh, hierarchy of show making. That's the difference. It was pretty terrifying. I did get the chance to perform, and I was uh, pretty nervous. But, but it was rewarding, definitely, and it was such a welcoming environment. On that note, my impression of what the industry is in, in New York was really um, contradicted by the event in the sense that, A, there's space. It's a big space. We're not pushed up against each other in a, in a small room. Um, people took the time. People did stay afterwards. There wasn't a rush feeling. You know, the show started late, and that was fine. Um, and everyone was so friendly with each other and so happy to chat um, about work, about whatever. Where are you from? All the rest. It was, it was quite uh, unexpected. I don't know what to expect either. TBD. Who knows? You just let it become what it becomes. We have this we have wonderful people in this city and we don't know each other as much as we should. Again, I was inspired by camaraderie. I was inspired by uh, the late night aspect of the 13th hour. I like that there's a community around uh, this, this, in, this presenting environment and I haven't seen that here and know that there's a version of it that is necessarily different than that for the kind of work that's going on, but it allows for heightened attention and willingness uh, to observe the details of performance while not having the institutional pressure that uh, most people are quarreling with. Uh, as they're trying to make good decisions about what they're doing on stage. Mm -hmm. Okay, you ready? Okay, can you reach that wheel? Go ahead and spin that wheel. <laughs> <laughs> Challenge your audience. 
challenge. You have a challenge for this audience. Okay. I challenge everybody to change their seats with their eyes closed. <laughs> On the count of three. <laughs> So let's talk about the launch of the Indiegogo campaign. As I understand, the intention behind it is to be a foundation for the company so that it can become self-reliant and sustaining from here on out. Yes, the model that we work with here is uh, that if we can do it, we should do it ourselves. That's how we built the space. We applied 80 gallons of paint with our dancers and our volunteer team and built an 1,800-square-foot sprung floor with our own design and our our team and as we use it it means so much more to us and we saved an enormous amount of money that's how we want to build this place entirely that the steps that it takes to create a sustainable organization one then can create its uh, an, it's in it's enough income to be healthy on its own through the activities, rather than relying on funding, which is the existing model for so many not-profits. Going and finding somebody who's going to give you this money and basing your operation on that source, rather than developing uh, an operation that itself is creating an endowment and using grants and funding to create new programs and develop pro programs, growing in that way. The Indiegogo campaign is to raise a lot of money up front so we can be staffed and get our teachers working at their best and have something for the community to realize and uh, to discover and incorporate into their lives. It's going to take some time to build this. But it doesn't take that much to actually sustain yourself. That's the thing. Why this works is because we contribute to the church. We create a, a shared responsibility that is this building by engaging each other in our, our activities and our concerns and investing in things together. I've changed a space, I've made their property more valuable by engaging a team of volunteer dancers. And we're connected now through that. There's a beautiful line in the promotional video for the campaign that uh, something along the lines of, this was built by people showing up, which I think encapsulates that idea for me. Dancers show up. That's what makes dancers incredible people to work with. You can't dance without showing up. Dance doesn't happen online. It doesn't happen anywhere but in the room where it's happening at the time that it's happening. So dancers are very used to showing up. And dancers are used to using their bodies to do things. So when you want to coordinate a factory line operation to produce a sprung floor with repetitive tasks, dancers take the direction well. I mean, you might have fun. We like to do what we do. We like to be physically engaged with our surroundings. And the photographs and video that was captured in the process of making, it's beautiful art. The sounds of this piano being tuned while the floor is being hammered into place. It's a video and it's beautiful and it exists. And people have these wonderful memories that they're already recalling about creating this space. It's so wonderful for people to come and say, oh, it was so interesting that day when we were painting uh, up on that scaffold. I'd never done anything like that. And to see it now and to be using the space in this way. So it's in the room is a lot of personal history for the people who are now dancing here and participating in, in events here. This is about the Indiegogo campaign, I promise. It's that model of involvement. Our Perks, for example, 
in the Indiegogo campaign are pre-selling class. Every perk is, is not something outside of what we do. It's not a t-shirt. That's not what we do. It's a class. That's what we do. And it brings you here. Come and join our community. That's the entire purpose of the campaign. It's not give us money so we can do something. It's come be a part of this. And if enough people are willing to do that, and we certainly have the capacity for, for that, then it will take care of itself. Its own membership will sustain it. Our income and our expense will allow us to operate in the black and probably create an endowment that we can use for our own program development. And then when we're interested in doing spectacular things or making big changes, that's when we go for grants. And we'll have so much more grounds to stand on when we're applying for them and we say, we're actually very responsible with money and this is an opportunity to boost something we're already doing. Why have we got in this, gotten into this cycle with not-for-profits where we're patronizing people for money? Patronizing people for money and the patrons why, why, are, why are we begging people for money when we can just show how valuable we are and that can be recognized instead? We should be awarded for doing things like this. This is a, an intelligent use of economy in New York or of economic thinking in a city that seems, that is described as being impossible in so many ways. So is this happening? I guess. Are we operating it? No, but this way we can operate. This is a way that we can operate. By having $100,000 up front, which is what our target is, and I believe that we can raise more than that, we're, we're looking at, e even from that, we're looking at years of pro programming at a complete loss. You know, if nobody showed up, that $100,000 could last us a long time. We don't have a big overhead. There is... It's going to take two of us to manage this thing, three of us maybe, a few part-time positions. A lot of it's trade, trade for participation in class. We're, ma we're not making over $30,000. I mean, we're making nothing right now. But the whole point is that we can live on about twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 as a full-time position here. I'm going to grasp that reality while I can finding people who can do that and are creative and want to make it work. That's how we're going to save money. That's how we're going to create savings for BKSD. And we've built these things for ourselves. That's a major savings in this organization. And finally, if people are pledge their, their support and simultaneously their participation in this campaign then we know that we're going to be able to provide, have the money to, and have an audience, and have participants because they've signed up for class. We're going to have years that we can just work into. And in, if we're smart, it's going to create more endowment for us to work more years in advance. This isn't $100,000 to burn through. This is $100,000 which we can use to have enough membership and income to exceed our expenses, our low overheads, our low salaries, our very generous rent here in the church as part of our trade and our partnership. And rather than focus on paying that rent, we together, the, the church and I, the church and us, we can focus on a capital campaign. A capital campaign is, is how we're going to repair this building at all. It's the demonstration of our cooperation and how it's gotten us this far, how it's starting to transform the building and make it possible for them to flourish. They've been dwindling in numbers for many years and the building is falling apart and they intend to bring it back and they mean to do it with a partner and now we're in partnership and now we're doing it. That's how we met each other. We were both seeking partnership. So it's together and their endorsement of us that's going to allow us to operate in this way and we want to in turn extend that generosity to the dance community. Not me turn, turn around and cash in on that, but spin the value back into. What I, I should say, what I mean me cash in, this build out's worth eighty to $100,000. So I general contracted this build out so it could be $22,000. So that, that's, my, that's me not 
not paying myself from this. And I will hold that place in value. I will not charge the organization for that, ever. So we have that, and that's my first contribution. So that is how we, we have withheld our working fees, our fees for creating this, and retained them in this imaginary endowment of value. Of, of the value is money not spent. That's what I'm trying to say. We're creating money not spent and finding ways to continue with that as if it were a savings. As if, it what, if, as if it is what makes us valuable in New York because the web is so tight and because we've done something so unique that relies on community value, it itself is an anomaly and therefore will be sought out by everybody whom it serves and who so badly needs it here. There is no doubt in anybody's mind that this kind of space is if not entirely unique, very much in demand and very little in supply. And we have a great demand f for dance activity, for community building activity, and it looks great. And the people who work here are excellent. It's got everything going for it. And we've balanced it very carefully in this small integrated market of the dance community, our shared labor is what we've put at the center of all of this. That is our currency amongst us. And we're going to tr continue to trade that currency amongst this community and not let it get traded for so many dollars that we lose control of it. Please help us do that. <laughs> Support our Indiegogo campaign. Brooklyn Studios for Dance, securing our longevity. I would encourage you to check out the video on their Indiegogo campaign because it does paints a really clear picture of what the project is here at the Brooklyn Studios for Dance and, uh, and how your contribution will support it. Thank you very much. The Dirty Feet Podcast is produced and hosted by Produit et animé par Alison Burns J.D. Pepillon and Stephanie morin robert We have Mainline Theatre, Montreal Improv Theatre and Paul of Lalo to thank. Merci pour le soutien. Vous pouvez visiter notre site web, écouter les derniers épisodes, lire notre blog, nous aimer sur Facebook et nous suivre sur Twitter. You can visit our website, listen to past episodes, read our blog, like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Show us some love and help us spread the word. Montrez-nous un peu d'amour et aidez-nous à passer le mot.